I'm Keith Mason, uh, founder of Person at USA, and uh, I'm here just to introduce some people, amazing people, like Mr. Don Fetter, uh, for World Congress of Paper. Okay, um, I was hoping there'd be a microphone, but there isn't, so can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. You might want to move just a bit closer, if that's possible. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest crisis that humanity will confront in the 21st century won't be global warming or a super virus sweeping the planet or a regional conflict going nuclear. We won't run out of oil or other natural resources anytime soon. However, if the current trends continue, we could very well begin running out of people in this century. The problem that is very real and very scary is declining fertility, also known as demographic winter. We start with a number, 2.1, also known as replacement level fertility. Now that's the number of children the average woman must have in her lifetime just to replace current population. More in your population increases, fewer in your population declines. By the way, for a nation as a whole, this is known as its total fertility rate, or TFR. Now here's a rather startling statistic. Worldwide, fertility has fallen by over 50% in less than 60 years. In other words, in 1960, the average woman on this planet had five children. Today, the average woman has 2.6, and that number is declining. Today, every industrialized nation has below replacement fertility, in some cases, well below replacement. Japan's total fertility rate is 1.39. That's roughly 66% below replacement. In the last 25 years, Japan's over 65 population is almost doubled, going from 11.6% to 21.2%. In 2012, Japan lost 100,000 people. It's estimated that by the midpoint of this century, the Japanese population will decline by 25%. For the European Union as a whole, the total fertility rate is 1.5. Again, well below replacement. For countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain, it's even lower. All other things being equal, demographers tell us that with a total fertility rate of 1.3 or less, a country will lose half of its population every 45 years. The collapse of fertility will lead to a world with fewer and fewer children and more and more elderly. According to the United Nations Population Division, there will be 248 million fewer children under five by the year 2050 than there are today. Consequently, we will have a smaller childbearing base in each generation, resulting in a downward spiral. Now, in the past 200 years, every human advance from the Industrial Revolution to the computer age has been accompanied by robust population growth. Since the Black Plague in the 14th century, we've never experienced prolonged population decline. But we could at some point in this century. The world of demographic winter will grow older and older and move slower and slower. With fewer and fewer to care for it, the mighty industrial engine that we've built over the last 200 years will eventually grind to a halt and rust. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the world that we know is dying. It's not homicide, it's suicide. Declining fertility can be traced to the 1960s, and what's come to be called 
the youth rebellion or youth culture, although its roots lie decades earlier. The hallmark of the 1960s, and I was part of that generation, by the way, was the rejection of authority, especially parental and religious authority. Supposedly, this was a sign of intellectual maturity and independence. In reality, it was blind acceptance of a set of cliches in place of eternal truths. Chief among these cliches was do your own thing, <coughs> which roughly translates as live for yourself. If you embrace this axiom, you become the warm, pulsating center of your own universe. <laughs> Planet U in the galaxy Dennis Rodman. Along with self-centeredness came a lessening of feelings of responsibility for the things that really matter. Curiously, we now feel responsible for endangered species, the rainforest, and the ozone layer, things over which we have absolutely no control, but not for our families, our nations, and our people. <coughs> In the past, men and women didn't ask why have children, any more than they asked why breathe or why eat. It was such a natural part of existence that it required no explanation. You had children because you had a responsibility to your family to assure its continuity. You had a responsibility to your people so that they would not go the way of the Babylonian and the Phoenician, whose downfall probably began when they started to fund Planned Parenthood. <laughs> and you had a responsibility to the God who created you and made procreation or fertility the first <coughs> commandment. Out of the youth rebellion came the sexual revolution, a term used to denote a sea change of attitudes and behaviors that included first separating sex from procreation then from marriage, and finally from love, or any sense of commitment. Pornography, premarital sex, promiscuity, and homosexuality were all normalized. <coughs> Abortion was legalized and is now enshrined as a fundamental right throughout the Western world. We've gone from criminalizing the sodomy to criminalizing the refusal to celebrate sodomy. The sexual revolution, ladies and gentlemen, shaped the world we live in more profoundly than anything that's happened in modern times. In fact, you might say more profoundly than anything that's happened in the last 500 years. Its prophets include Sigmund Freud, feminists like Margaret Sanger, the mother of the abortion industry, advanced men posing as researchers, like Alfred Kinsey and Masters and Johnson, and pornographers like Hugh Hefner, all aided and abetted by the political cultural elite, Hollywood in particular. The sexual revolution rests on six axioms. One, when sex, when, excuse me, when sex is consensual, it's always good. Two, the primary purpose of sex is pleasure not share, not childbearing or spiritual connection. Three, the primary purpose of life is pleasure. Four, inhibitions lead to neuroses and should be avoided at all costs. Five, sex has nothing to do with morality. And six, sex is not only values free, but should be free of consequences. Hence, legalized abortion and subsidized contraception. The effects of sexual revolution on fertility have been profound, far-reaching, and possibly irreversible. For the first time in human history, just under half of the world's population of childbearing age uses some form of birth control. The global contraceptives market generates an estimated $17 billion annually. 
This is financed primarily by governments, NGOs, and employers. Other species have become extinct. Ours may be the first to subsidize its own extinction. By the way, if there's anyone from the Human Rights Campaign in the audience, I'm not suggesting that contraception be illegal. I'm simply saying that contraception is one of the contributing factors to declining fertility. Worldwide, ladies and gentlemen, there are 42 million abortions a year. That's twice the number of military deaths in the Second World War, the bloodiest conflict in human history. Except these aren't deaths on a battlefield. These are casualties a nation inflicts on itself. We're losing 42 million people a year, but we're losing their children, their grandchildren, their descendants, down through the ages. In the United States, between 2009 and 2010, there was a 13% increase in unmarried couples living together, also known as cohabitation. That's on top of a tenfold increase between 1960 and the year 2000. In France, in 2010, more people began living together than married. Given the impermanence of these relationships, and by the way, most of them last less than a year, obviously unmarried couples are going to have fewer children than married couples. In 1960, 59 percent of all adults in the United States between the ages of 18 and 29 were married, compared to only 20 percent today. Fewer marriages, equal fewer children. In a 2010 Time Magazine survey, 39% said marriage was obsolete, up from 28% in 1978. Ladies and gentlemen, if marriage is obsolete, then the human race is obsolete. By the way, those who think marriage is outdated should consider the words of Raquel Welch. In an article last year, the 1970s sex symbol wrote, quote, is marriage a viable option? I'm ashamed to admit that I myself have been married four times, and yet I still feel that it is the cornerstone of civilization and an essential institution that stabilizes society, provides a sanctuary for children, and saves us from anarchy. Now, if time allowed, we could discuss the effects of the decline of faith on fertility. In Europe, empty churches have led to empty hearts and empty cradles. By the way, there's a very simple formula for determining who's having children and who isn't. Those who have faith in the future have children. Those who don't, don't. Where does faith in the future come from? It comes from faith. It comes from religion. By the way, for those of you who aren't aware of it, Utah has one of the highest levels of church attendance in the United States and also the highest birth rate. Think about this. Who is going to do society's vital work in a nation with fewer and fewer children? Who's going to operate the farms and factories? Who's going to serve in law enforcement? Who will be the entrepreneurs, the health care providers, the teachers, the soldiers? Who will do all of society's vital tasks? Our health care expenditures and our tax burden will skyrocket. Obviously, a 75-year-old requires more medical services than a 25-year-old. The declining number of workers will be called on to provide pensions and health care for a growing number of elderly, also known as the, gray, <coughs> excuse me, as the graying of the West. Inevitably, this will lead to health care rationing and euthanasia, which I think is the real agenda of Obamacare. 
Can we do anything to avert demographic winter? We could start by ending abortion. We could stop subsidizing contraception and start promoting procreation. We could stop undermining marriage and start reinforcing that institution on which society's survival depends. We could extol the joys of parenthood again instead of treating parents as functionaries of the state. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, the sexual revolution is about death. Death through abortion, death through sexually transmitted disease, death through pornography, death through promiscuity, in place of monogamous marriage and childbearing. It's interesting, choice is a watchword of the anti-family left. The concept is more relevant than it could ever imagine. In thousands of ways, each day, humanity chooses its future or non-future. But the wonderful thing about being human is that, unlike animals, we can conceptualize. Besides conceiving children, we can conceive ideas. By the application of reason, we can evaluate theories, accepting them or rejecting them. Besides morality, the ultimate test of an idea is its practicality. Does it work? The ideas that have led to the tragedy of rapidly falling fertility are disastrously wrong and must be replaced by better ideas if civilization is to survive. On the eve of the First World War, Edward Gray, who was then the British Foreign Minister, remarked, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, lamps are going out all over the world. Those lamps are the children who were never born. Unless we light them quickly, humanity won't have a future. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was great. Um, now, uh, all the way from Moscow, we'd like to Vladimir come up from the St. Andrews Foundation.
Yes. Yes, but I'll, I'll tell you better than my speech. It's a documentary. This gentleman in the front row had something to do with writing and producing it. It's called Demographic Winter, The Decline of the Human Family. Uh, there's a booth for Family First Foundation in the exhibition hall. They have copies of the documentary there. Besides that, besides Demographic Winter, the documentary, I would recommend to all of you a novel. The novel is called The Children of Men by P. James. It is a very poignant story about a world where the last child was born 25 years before due to a worldwide plague of infertility. I think it gives you a clear idea of where we're heading. Not all at once, but great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Sorry you. for Sorry, I took some of your time. <laughs> so let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Vladimir Mishchenkov. I am from Moscow, from Russia. I have a PhD uh, degree in sociology. Um, I took part in a couple of previous uh, world congresses uh, in Sydney, in Madrid. And I'm happy to meet all of you here at the World Congress of Family, organized by our old Partners. So uh, today I'd like to speak frankly about the way not indifferent people um, try to secure family values and Christian family in Russia. If you have any questions, do, do not hesitate to address to me in the end of my presentation. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Vice President of uh, St. Andrew Foundation. Um, it is one of the oldest and uh, um, biggest uh, social organization in Russia. Uh -huh. And uh, the main program, program of our uh, organization uh, is uh, Sanctity of Mother. Well, uh, in this slide you can see words of uh, great uh, Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, who lived in the US for a long time. Today, the efficiency of uh, social structure should be estimated according to its ability to ensure the reproduction of population. In this slide, I have presented the most common demographic tendencies of the world. Almost half families in the world have one or maximum two children. The same works for Russia, where 94-95% of families have one or two children and two-thirds of such families have only one child. Uh, the main reason for that is sharp decline of family and children-oriented lifestyle. I can back it up with numbers of birth rates in this slide. You can see that birth rates in different countries uh, declined for more than twice. In the beginning of 20th, uh, 20th century, uh, during 20 years of reign of the last Russian Tsar Nikolai II, uh, total population of Russia increased for 40%, which grew up for 50 million people. So it became 185 million people. Now we have in Russia 146 million people. During the reign of Nikolai II, uh, Russia was the third country in the world uh, after Great Britain and China with biggest population.
here you can see the threads difference. In the beginning of the 20th century, it was about seven. Well, in the end of the 20th century, it became about one. State policy in the beginning of Soviet era uh, in Russia aimed at destruction of family as social institution. In 1920, abortion, abortions were legalized in Russia, and in 1926, obligatory state registration of marriage was abolished. After the Second World War, abortions were prohibited in Russia. You can see here the diagram. <coughs> of birth rates in Russia during the 20th century. Vladimir, can you point out, I can't quite see that, can you point out uh, where we're going? Now. Can... You, you mean now? Oh, what? what point? Yeah, 1942. Is that where the, the, the dip is? The this low point? Yeah. yeah. That point? Yeah. 19. It's, uh, it's 1946. Okay. It's a great, uh, it's a second world war. Okay, thank you. In the early 90s, Russia started its development on the liberal model of society, uh, where state pro-family policy was destroyed. The population was the result of this process. This made Russian government in 2006, start pro family policy. You can see that the difference between definitions family with children and family without children reduced twice from 14.39 in 1976 to 8.60 in 2000, which means that the concept of childless family has strengthened now. In the slide you can see a table from our latest research with Anatoly Antonov, Professor Anatoly Antonov, of attitude of Russian citizens to the number of children in a family. We used system of semantic differential which gives the most precise data. Professor Anatoly Antonov says that Russia shall have 55 of families of more than three children so that not to die out. Now we have 5%. There are two ways to overcome the depopulation. And the first one is increase is increase of birth rate to 2.15 children per one woman. The second one is immigration to compensate the population decline. But it has, as you all understand, negative aspects. In order to overcome the population in Russia, there should be 10% of families with one child, 35% with two children, another 35% with three children, 17% uh, with four children, and on top, 3% with five or more children. Our aim. This is the basic demographic uh, data of uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, in 2014, the birth rate was equal to 1.76 
current birth rate for the first half of uh, 2015 is showing slight decrease, unfortunately. The reason for that is reduction of number of women in fertile age. This means that birth rate potential research its maximum level in society. Though state bodies do their best to increase birth rates. Mr. Putin defined family with three children to become the main demographic goal of pro family policy. This new goal was reflected in concept of state family policy in Russia up to 2025, which names traditional family values as main priorities. Such change of state family policy in Russia resulted in increase of birth rates and number of people. As you see, United Nations forecast was lower. It's, it's forecast and it's the uh, situation now, current situation. Here are the main <coughs> spheres of family values support economic, social, psychological, and medical measures. It's planned to increase the state maternity funding in 2015 by 5.5%, which is now approximately 7,000 US dollars. But uh, before the economical crisis, it was approximately 14,000 uh, dollars. Unfortunately, state funding of maternity uh, did not increase necessity in children, but only accelerated birth of the next child. It's true. One of the main medical measures of support of, of, of support is building of perinatal uh, centers in Russia. In this graphic, you see that uh, both young and adult Russian respondents declare that family is the main value. But this is only a statement. In fact, we see that there are a great number of divorces and uh, childless families. Here you can see the same information. I have already told about the role of social organizations in Russia. One of the most well-known organizations is St. Andrew Foundation. Uh, and our program, Sanctity of Motherhood, uh, headed by Natalia Ikunina. Our main victory is adoption of pro-family state policy concept last year in Russia. Here you see our activity in Parliament, uh, in Parliament life of Russia. Well, each person has to decide what future world we want to build for our children. We have to coordinate Russian demographic policy to consolidate Russian society and strengthen pro-family policy. Thank you for your attention.
But uh, maybe if you want to set up your computer. I don't think we have an actual one. This is his, right? This is no. Vladimir's. Oh, this is not the one that was on the table? This is Reverend, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, maybe uh, if there's uh, any questions for yes, Vladimir please. while um, Steve is setting up his computer. Maybe that would be efficient time. use of, uh, of that so we can work out. Any, any questions? You mentioned the uh, subsidy for having a child was used to be fourteen thousand dollars, and now it's seven. Uh, exchange rates or something. Um, and then you said something that it did not have the effect of desire. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, so, no. Uh, you know, we have now a economical crisis in Russia, and the uh, majority of funding it's uh, a sum of money for the second child. Uh, it's a state the maternity fund. So it's uh, before crisis it was approximately fourteen thousand. Now it's approximately seven because the sum in ruble the same, and uh, each year it increased by five, six, seven percent. But anyway, the real situation. But it didn't increase fertility. Um, Increased the sum, uh, sum in rubles. Uh, money. Ma ma yes, maternity fund. But paying the maternity fund didn't yes. increase the uh, reproduction rates? Did no. Uh, yes, uh, our birth rates increased. But uh, I, s I told that uh, it is only accelerated process. Uh, because matern state maternity funding is only for the second child. Mm -hmm. That's all. If you want the third, sorry, this is the problem. But Vladimir, you said that uh, Mr. Putin, though, was his his vision is for a full family to be three children. Minimum three. Do you see them adjusting that policy to accommodate that? It's a um, very difficult uh, goal, very difficult uh, aim. Because now uh, I told you that we have uh, approximately 5% of family like this. So family <coughs> with uh, three and more children now, 5%. But we need minimum 55%. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have economical crisis, we have something one and so on. But uh, anyway, I think that um, my is not uh, the the main reason uh, for for birth. So I think uh, we have to change our mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, the main thing. And uh, where as uh, we are as uh, social organizations, we understand it. And we try to do something in this uh, field, mm -hmm. in society life. Do you have any contact information for you to get some of your, do you have a website or something we can yes. review some yes. of the slides? Yes, I can get it. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry I was a little late today. I was double booked. And uh, despite 30 years of public speaking, I've never been able to figure out how to bilocate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a twin, so. I only got to hear part of your excellent presentation, but I knew the first. I know the first part was just as good as the uh, the second part that I did hear. I was surprised by one thing that you said. I was surprised to hear you quoting Raquel Welch, <laughs> who's been married four times on the importance of marriage. I mean, who knew that Raquel Welch could think? <laughs> well, I think you know. I think she was saying I'm not a good example, but I've learned by my mistakes. And we all learn from our mistakes in the course of uh, our lives, don't we? Um, I learned from my mistakes. Actually, I was taught in China the importance of children by my Chinese neighbors who, in 1979 and 1980, when I was there, were being denied the right to have children. The one-child policy began in 1980, and there were friends and neighbors of mine who were arrested for the crime of being pregnant. The crime of being pregnant because all of a sudden the state Beijing, the Beijing regime had declared that it was illegal to have a second child too soon, or a third child, or a fourth, or a higher order child. And so all of the women 
in the commune that I was living in, which was Junon People's Commune, were, who were pregnant were told that they would have to terminate their pregnancies. Now, you can imagine that some of them said, weren't very happy about that, and some of them said no, but no was not an acceptable answer. The state had spoken, and the only thing for them to do was to march in lockstep down to the local abortuary and abort their children. Um, in some cases, they had to be frog marched. They had to be taken under escort. They were locked up. They were taken uh, under escort to the local abortion clinic. There they were given lethal injections into the womb and sometimes given cesarean section abortions if they were seven, eight, nine months pregnant. There were babies that were killed at birth. I had been pro-choice up to that point. But I will tell you this, that if you're in the operating room when a woman who is eight months pregnant was crying and screaming, is forcibly aborted, and you see a cesarean section abortion performed as I did, and you see the result of the abortion as a tiny living son of Adam or daughter, daughter of Eve, you will not think the same about abortion after that fact. You will become pro-life as I did. It would take a very hard heart not to become pro-life. Just as it will take a very hard heart not to watch the Planned Parenthood videos and decide this organization should not only be defunded, it should be abolished. Now, Don has already ably covered the demographic collapse that we're seeing around the world, especially in the developing countries. Um, so let me focus a little bit more on China. Now, when I arrived in China in 1979, this was right after the high tide of, uh, of, of Maoism, when China's hundreds of millions of peasants had been forced to join agricultural collectives, sometimes 10,000, sometimes 100,000 people strong, and farm the land in common. No one owned the land, no one took responsibility for the crops, and food production did not increase. Uh, I was down here in, in Guangdong province, I speak Cantonese and, and Mandarin. Now I blame China's poverty on overpopulation, because that's what I had been taught. There were people everywhere. In fact, this is a picture of the Pearl River Delta. This was a market in the Pearl River Delta, 1979. You see the people riding bikes. In the background are fields of sugar cane. The Pearl River Delta is one of the most densely populated rural areas on Earth. And you might well think, if you were Paul Ehrlich now, because he hasn't learned anything, or Stephen Mosier in 1979, that the Pearl River Delta was overpopulated. Well, look at, and, and of course, one of my colleagues at Stanford University I was teaching at the University of California in Berkeley, and I was finishing a PhD at Stanford, was Paul Ehrlich, whose book, The Population Bomb, I had been forced to read in college four times. I was paying to be propagandized. And of course, he, he was totally wrong about the fact that, uh, that, that, uh, that China's people were the problem. Because once China's people were given a chance to start businesses and farm their own private farms, the main we saw the real constraint on wealth creation in China was not too many people, but the poverty of communism. It was the bureaucratic totalitarian state that was holding the Chinese people back. Once the Chinese people were allowed to own property, open markets, and buy and sell goods, the economy exploded. And this is the Pearl River Delta today. This is the same spot that you saw you know, 30, 30, 30, 35 years ago, okay? So it doesn't take long if people are free to engage in economic activity, especially if they're Chinese, among the most uh, entrepreneurially minded, uh, uh, hardworking people in the world today, they, you can transform in a generation your country. So people create wealth, and the more people you have, the better off you are, right? Well, Paul Ehrlich would disagree. Most of the people who still advocate the myth of overpopulation would dis disagree. And, in fact, the Chinese government disagrees because the Chinese government is still carrying on the one-child policy today. The Chinese government brags, in fact, the Minister of Health of the Chinese government bragged to me that because of the one-child policy, they had eliminated 400 million people from their population. That is 400 million of the most productive, <coughs> enterprising people the world has ever seen. That is 400 million people who, if allowed to live, would now be many of them in the workforce producing goods and services, producing more than they consume. Every baby born in China is an economic asset. They will produce more over their economic lifetime than they will consume. And they've been eliminated irrationally. And the Chinese government claims that China is better off. In fact, there is now a nationwide uh, labor shortage. There are now proposals in China that um, 
because, because of the one-child policy, tens of millions of women have been eliminated from the population. Right? Why? Because there's a preference for sons on the one hand, there's a one-child policy on the other. The two collide and produce what? Produce the selective killing of little girls in utero and after birth. Female infanticide, sex-selective abortion on a massive scale. This is gender side, not genocide, gender side, the killing of one specific gender. Now there are proposals in China to uh, engage in, uh, in polygamy, uh, in fact, but not, not, uh, not classical polygamy in China was one man having three or four wives. Uh, they propose now that uh, one, one woman will have three or four husbands. Uh, this is a kind of distortion in the sex ratio that China's one-child policy has created. I don't know if this will play or not. If it does, it'll be fun to watch. If it doesn't, we'll just move along. I hope you can hear it. When human beings first showed up on this planet, there weren't very many of us. And we faced a hard life of meeting our basic needs. Chances are, early humans spent a good deal of time hungry, cold, and without shelter. That is to say, poor. According to the World Bank, poverty is when people are deprived of well-being as a result of low income and aren't able to get the basic goods that they need for survival with dignity. How did any of the human race advance beyond poverty? We kept multiplying and we formed communities. In communities, people stop spending all their time on simple survival and are able to do things like divide up tasks, share resources, and pool their mental energies to come up with creative solutions to problems. These communities started with families, then grew into extended families, entire tribes, and then finally cities and nations. So what effect has this growth had on poverty? According to demographers, a very good one. In fact, history shows that as our numbers have grown, so has our average standard of living. Scientists measure this standard in everything from per capita income the average amount of calories consumed, even average height. And all of these averages have been increasing. Even though poverty still exists, the percentage of poor people has actually decreased as population has grown. The reason for this is that human beings are not simply consumers, we are producers. This is why, over the ages, we have learned how to do things like produce more food on less land, find better energy sources, and make sure that more people have enough to eat and a roof over their heads. And this is also why, though urban poverty is still a huge problem, statistics show that the poor who move to large communities actually have better chances of rising from poverty than they did in areas where there were fewer jobs and less opportunity. For this reason, poverty is a problem that is not solved by eliminating people. Poverty has always been a problem, even when there were scarcely any people on the entire planet. People are the only proven way out of poverty. Removing them will only leave the poor right where they started. Think about it. So there are a whole series of videos on different aspects of the myth of overpopulation uh, on our website, pop.org, pop.org, also on our other website, overpopulationisamyth.com, overpopulation is a myth. It's a myth that kills, that's a story for another, um, for another time. Let me, let me go now to the, uh, to the end of uh, the presentation, because we all know that, as, as Don has said, that as as uh, too few young people come in the workforce and start new businesses, consumption goes down, investment goes down, um, and uh, the elderly consume more than they produce, economies slow down, China's population is going, the, the largest, uh, most populated country in the world is going to be overtaken by India in, in a few more years in terms of total population, and now the long-term economic prospects for India with its still growing population look rosier than the long-term economic prospects for China, which will have a huge numbers of elderly who will probably be subject to the same kind of population control program that young women have been subjected to over the last 35 years. Only instead of being told, uh, the young women, pregnant women, the mothers being told to report to the abortion clinic, the elderly will be told to report to the euthanasia center. Euthanasia, in fact, is already being practiced in China on a significant scale. I had a few things here on Russia, but of course we have Vladimir here, who I wouldn't dare say anything on Russia because he knows he's forgotten more about Russia than I ever learned. Um, now, 
those who encourage the decline of the population, you realize there are a lot of people who think that the decline of the population is a good thing. There are groups that advocate the carrying capacity of the world as being only one billion. And they say we're 7.2 billion now and we have to eliminate 6.2 billion of us. And I guarantee you when they say that, they're not thinking of elim eliminating themselves, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because there can never be too many of them, but there are way too many of us, okay? So we're the targets of these programs. The poor, the vulnerable, the people of faith, the Russians, yeah. So, um, so we have created, but we have created a political system, an economic system, a popular culture that is at best indifferent and at worst hostile to our long-term survival as nations and people. We have a political system that produces more and more debt and more and more dependency upon the government. We like to say in, in, uh, in farm country, in the Shenandoah Valley, in where I live, and I raise cows and chickens and children, I have eight children, my wife and I. I don't want to claim sole responsibility for that. Uh, but we say in the Shenandoah Valley that cows moo and dogs bark and politicians spend money. And the more money they can get their hands on, the happier they are because they give it to their friends who in turn give it back to them and they're re-elected and the process continues. Um, the late great Professor Charles Rice, uh, who taught constitutional law at Notre Dame University, on the first day of class would always ask his bright young Notre Dame law students if anyone knew the definition of politics. And of course, they all raised their hands, and they were ready to, to spring up and say something about polis and the Latin root. And he said, no, no, you've got it wrong. He said, politics, many small blood-sucking animals. OK? <laughs> now, the government uh, is parasitical. And like any parasite, it seeks the most rewarding prey, the prey that it can get the most blood from. And in the human race, the most rewarding prey for a government is the intact family. Now, why is that true? Well, because, as you know from listening to other presentations at this conference, the intact family produces more wealth than singletons. It has a longer time horizon than singletons. It is most of the wealth of a country, including the United States, is concentrated in the hands of couples who have been married for 20 and 30 and 40 years and who have scrimped and saved and prudently planned uh, for their retirement. Uh, people who are single tend to, to squander their wealth. So in the United States, when we began setting up generous welfare programs in the 60s, who was going to fund it? Well, not the singletons, but the families. And the government of the United States found a very convenient way to do that. It used the Internal Revenue Service, right? The income tax in 1946 was originally set up so that a family of uh, a, father, a husband and a wife and two children with a $600 per dependent deduction and an average annual income of $2,400, which was the average income in 1946, would pay no taxes. But over the years, that deduction was not raised. And yet inflation and growth raised the family's income. And so couples with children began bearing more and more and more of the burden of funding the federal government which in the 1960s, as Don mentioned, went into the, the great society. We were going to eliminate uh, poverty. And of course now, as Governor Brownback reminded us, at trillions of dollars later, we have more poverty than ever. You see, you get more of what you subsidize. You always get more of what you subsidize. And the government is subsidizing um, single motherhood. So what should we do to get out of this, this um, this vicious circle, where the weaker the family becomes, the more state intervention is called for, the more uh, single mothers we have, the more broken homes we have, the more divorce we have, um, the more people on welfare and other government benefits we have. How do you get out of that? I think you do two things. The first thing you do is you immediately reduce the tax rates on couples who are willing to have children. A couple who is married, not just living together, but married, and has one child should have their taxes reduced by one-third. A couple who is married with two children should have their taxes, all taxes, reduced by two-thirds. And a couple who's willing to have three or more children should pay no taxes to the government. Why? Because their, dispo their income is going into something more important than funding 
the Environmental Protection Agency. Their income is going into raising children. And the only future a country has are its children. They're investing their time and their energy, their talent, their money into the next generation of Americans. You see, the state can do many things. It can defend, if it chooses to, the borders of a country. Uh, it can provide uh, welfare benefits. But one thing the state cannot do is the state cannot reproduce. That's up to individuals. That's up to families. So that the first thing we should do is shelter young couples who are willing to have children, large families, from all taxes. Now, you might say that's a little self-serving, Steve, because you have eight children. But actually, I only have two children at home, so I'm mostly out of the business of reproducing. But I do have five grandchildren. And by the time my eight are done, hopefully they will be 50 or so if everyone does their duty. <laughs> the second thing we should do is we should stop incentivizing single motherhood. Now, you really can't cut off the welfare payments to women with small children. I'm not advocating doing that. But I do think that we can institute a marriage bonus. If a couple is living together and, and the woman gets pregnant or not, and, but they decide to get married, there should be a marriage bonus. There should be a way for for uh, society to encourage marriage. We can do that culturally, but we have to remember that Hollywood is never going to be on side in this effort, so we're going to have to do it through our own media, through our own networks. But we need to get, we need to, I think, start subsidizing, start subsidizing marriage by, by instituting a marriage bonus. Um, and at the end of the day, if we do that, I think that our civilization will survive. If we don't do that, I think we're going to uh, we're going to over the next generations see ourselves, Europe, uh, Latin America, North America uh, go into a kind of we, we've entered into a kind of slow but inexorable collective suicide pact if you think about it because we're we're not having sufficient children to maintain the current uh, numbers. Um, at the end of the day, the meek will inherit the earth. This was my family a few years ago. You see I have more hair, but the numbers are the same. Thank you very much.